When Aaron Fryer went missing in 2017 and large amounts of blood were found in his home, investigators strongly believed that he'd been the victim of foul play. Shockingly, one of the suspects was Aaron's own 15-year-old daughter, Ellie. Ellie and two other suspects, including Ellie's adult boyfriend, Gavin, were quickly arrested. And what followed are the most bizarre police interrogations you may ever witness. Would you betray your own family for love? This is the disturbing case of Ellie Fryer. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. I will tell you I got a little bit transfixed by watching the interrogations within this case to give myself a better understanding of the characters that we are dealing with regarding the individuals responsible for the murder. And I did lose quite a few hours of my life, I'm not gonna lie, because it was really intriguing to actually see these individuals interrogated and also the way that they were acting during said interrogation. Obviously, every single murder is different and indeed, the suspects and eventually the defendants in those cases are often interrogated and we get to view that footage and it introduces us to just how different offenders are. But I don't think I've ever seen a group of individuals quite so unusual when it comes down to the interrogations and that's what led me to deep dive into this case. Also, I'm always really interested in what motivates familial killings because for the most part, the vast majority of us, even when we have problems in our relationships with our family members, the last thing that we think about doing is ending their lives. Because there are a multitude of other opportunities that you can take to change your situation, aside from literally ending the life of the person you have the problem with. So every time I cover a case where there's a familial killing, that's the question, why? Why didn't you choose another route. Why didn't Ellen Fryer decide that there was a better way of managing her situation? So let's talk about Ellen Fryer. She went by the name of Ellie. She had two other sisters, Sierra and Olivia. And although the girl's parents were actually separated, they did spend time with both their mum and dad. So whilst they had gone through the slings and arrows, so to speak, of a breakup, they actually had relationships with both parties. Aaron, their dad, he lived in Medford, Southern Oregon. And when the girls were staying with him, he would actually sleep on the couch. Ellie would sleep in his bedroom with Sierra and Olivia sharing the other bedroom. Ellie attended the South Medford High School. She actually played in the school band there. She was considered quite a bright student. She was a good student. She was very intelligent. And she was actually considered to be academically gifted. And there was no doubt whatsoever that Ellie is a bright person. No matter how bizarre her interrogation to witness is, the reality is that it's clear that she's quite smart. She hasn't got the maturity that she will eventually have in her life because she's a kid, and therefore, shall I say, her manipulation level is high, but certain not sophisticated, simply high for her age frame, but she hasn't got the wisdom required to hold down a level of manipulation that can outsmart, shall we say, the authorities. But she's certainly bright. She meets a young man called Gavin McFarlane. So he went to the same high school as Ellie, but he's a few years above her. So he had actually dropped out before he'd even managed to graduate. He was an odd character, I will say that. Allegedly, he used to like hanging around outside the school after he left. I don't think that's normal behavior, seriously. If you're hanging around outside of school, it tends to be because you want to hang out with younger people. And there are different reasons why people will do this. So arguably, emotional immaturity, you connect more with lower peers. That does happen. We see young boys grow into young adult males without managing to travel a distance with their peers effectively. 
And because of that, maybe because they're a little bit strange or they don't connect with people of their age as they should for that age frame, they gravitate towards younger people, like I said, particularly young men, because they get to be placed in more of a hero category. 14 and 15 year old young people will look at a 19 year old and think that they're pretty cool based merely on their age. Whereas when you're 19 and you look at another 19 year old, you judge them accordingly as a peer. So the fact that he's hanging outside the school, it probably lends itself to that reality that he likes to be seen as somebody more important than he is seen by his peers. And it can also suggest that he's interested in younger girls too. And again, probably because the uh, older guy is often revered by younger girls simply because of his age. Obviously, as we get older, we realize we shouldn't do that. It's just that they're oddballs who shouldn't be around us at all because they're far older than us. But that tends to be the psychological reasoning behind why individuals will hang out around younger people. Now, when Ellie is 15 years of age, she starts speaking to 19-year-old Gavin through Facebook. And they hit it off, they get on well, and they start dating. Also, it seems like they didn't wait too long before having a sexual relationship. They've been together just a little while. And understandably, when it comes down to Ellie's dad, Aaron, he was not happy about the relationship because there is, as far as he is concerned, a significant age frame difference. So even though it's only four years, that's a big deal when it comes down to the difference between a 19 year old and a 15 year old. For example, when I was 15 years of age, I was in school. When I was 19 years of age, I'd bought my first home. Bear in mind, it was a lot cheaper then. It was unbelievably cheap. My first home cost less than a very average priced car these days. Times were different is what I'm saying, but that demonstrates the difference of my maturity. At 15, I was bunking off school. I was playing pool in pubs with older people because it was a way of passing the time. By 19, I was responsible and literally paying bills in my own home. So it makes sense that Aaron is somebody who is gonna be concerned about his daughter hanging out with this young man. Also, her father is gonna know that there is a strong likelihood that they are gonna be having a sexual relationship because Gavin is 19 and it's likely he's going to want that and he will not feel that his daughter is of a mindset and maturity that can manage such a situation. So he's really unhappy about their connection. He tries to forbid Ellie from actually seeing Gavin, and he even attempts to warn Gavin away from his daughter. And he even went so far as to actually end up filing statutory rape charges against Gavin, because obviously his daughter was a minor, and even though that would be something that she wouldn't want to happen, it would be a way of creating a boundary between Gavin and his daughter. Arguably, it's also going to amplify a lot of resentment as far as Ellie is concerned, because she is going to believe that she's in love with Gavin and that her father is essentially standing in the way. Not just that, is placing Gavin in the line of fire because statutory rape is a very serious offence. Obviously, it's saying that Gavin is literally in a scenario where because she can't consent he is raping her essentially and that can carry a hefty hefty sentence so she is going to be very upset with him and one would imagine that gavin would also feel the same level of motivation because it is a deeply threatening scenario to be placed in even if you are deserving it when a parent goes ahead and tries to have you charged with that, particularly when you misguidedly believe that you're in love and that there is nothing wrong with your relationship and Gavin will certainly believe that. Now, remember, psychologically, as a young person, you don't really have a lot of experience with relationships per se. So for Ellie, the fact that now this love is forbidden and the fact that Gavin still wants to be in her life, that's probably quite alluring. She'll feel important, she'll feel validated, it will give her a sense of worthiness, it will bolster her self-esteem. Even though it's temporary, those scenarios, the truth is, in that moment, the fact that Gavin wants to be with her still in spite of these threats, that will be a really alluring quality. I have sympathy with any parent who recognises that their child is in a relationship with somebody that they find inappropriate. Also, I do have some sympathy where there is an age gap such as a 15 year old with a 19 year old. I know legally it is completely wrong and certainly my own boys would 100% know that that would not be acceptable. 
I also understand that when I was 15, a lot of my friends had older boyfriends of 18 and 19, and they weren't sexual predators, and many of them ended up having long-term relationships and marriages with them. But the point is the law is the law. And so Gavin should recognize at that point that whether he likes it or otherwise, the father is saying no, and it should be respected. Equally, I recognize that Ellie and Gavin will consider themselves in a scenario where somebody is trying to get in the way of something that they think is the most amazing love story ever, and therefore will rebel against it. But like I said, I can see both sides of this situation, but ultimately only one side is legal, and that is that you cannot have sex with a minor, and Gavin is choosing to do that. So even though the age difference at a later date when she's 25 and he's 29 would not be that much of an issue. 15 years of age, Ellie is not at the age of consent and that has to be acknowledged and accepted. Now there was one incident where Ellie actually told her parents that she was going to stay at her friend Gillian's house and this is a lie. She's actually staying at Gavin's and that brings a friend into a very challenging situation because obviously you don't want to be used as an excuse that could lead you to getting into trouble, particularly if it involves somebody who is at risk of being charged by the police. So ultimately that shows that Ellie is quite happy to hang her friends out to dry to get what she wants. And that's a level of manipulation. So Ellie actually asked Gillian to cover for her to say that she'd been at her house and she did do that. But when Aaron rings Gillian, she goes ahead and lies to protect Ellie. But even though she did that, It really changed the relationship that she had with Ellie because Gillian said that it made her realise that she could no longer really trust Ellie because essentially she ended up being put in a position where she had to lie to an adult and again place herself in a situation where she could get into trouble because of her friend's selfish needs essentially. Now Gavin, he would later say that he had had altercations with Ellie's father that were pretty high level So there was one point where Aaron had actually held a gun towards him because he had come round to the house to see Ellie. But even though he was literally in a position where her father was to some degree threatening to shoot him, it hadn't actually dissuaded the pair from seeing one another. And I always think it's very challenging for parents, isn't it? When they're in a situation where their child believes that they know better and we can all look back at our teenage years. You know, not everybody had the confidence and the conviction in their beliefs, but certainly when I look back at myself and certainly the young people that I worked with for many, many years, often the mass majority of them thought that they knew better than anybody. So as a teenager, you often have a misguided confidence that what you think is correct. It doesn't matter what advice you're being given. It doesn't matter what the law is. What matters is how you feel and you operate within that mindset. So even though the world around them is saying you can't be together, they're motivated by those feelings, emotionally, sexually, physically, romantically, and that pulls them towards one another. And that's why it's difficult for parents because it's finding that balance. Is it going to be effective to absolutely carte blanche say, no, you can't have a relationship? Or is it better to help your child recognize why certain elements of a relationship are not appropriate at their age. In this case, would it have been more appropriate for Ellie and Gavin to be allowed to carry on seeing each other, but under supervision, therefore no sexual contact would be occurring until such a point that Ellie was emotionally mature enough to get engaged in a relationship with him of that nature. That would be an option, but that isn't how it plays out. Also, it's not helpful in any situation where an individual threatens violence towards somebody else to try to affect a change to the behaviour because often it doesn't work. And in this case, it's going to fester and foster resentment both from Ellie and Gavin towards Ellie's father. So they carry on seeing each other. And by September 2017, they've actually been dating for around a year. So now they're going to be fully invested in their relationship. They're going to have built their bonds. They're going to be emotionally intimate and they're going to feel like a team to some degree. Now on September the 30th, 2017, there's actually an attempted break-in at Aaron's home. This is through the bedroom window. But it seems that once the individuals who've broken into the property realise that Aaron's girlfriend, Michelle Robinson, is sleeping in the bedroom, it motivates them to actually flee the scene. And that's likely because whoever had broken in was not expecting to find her there. 
Now, Aaron was really unnerved by this breaking attempt. Of course he was. So the way that he manages this is to actually go and get an aluminium baseball bat for protection. He starts keeping that close by where he slept. But he's obviously worried that there might be a repeat because you don't go out and get something like that to use for your own protection unless you fear that somebody's coming for you. So it is possible that Aaron had some kind of misgivings and some instinct about things potentially happening to him in the future. We get to October the 2nd, 2017, so not long after that attempted break-in. This is in the early morning, so it's before 7 a.m. Police officers attend the Friar household, and they do that to do a welfare check. So Aaron's daughters, Sierra and Olivia, they've woken up for school, and they can't find the dad. So after they realise he isn't there, they contact Michelle, and they contact the mother, and the police are subsequently called to the house. Now, when the police arrive at the home, immediately they notice that Aaron isn't there and his car isn't there. But even though he isn't present and the car isn't present, they can tell that something has happened in the home. There's obviously been a disturbance. So there's large, and I mean large amounts of blood there. And instantly that means that as far as the officers are concerned, something sinister had occurred the night before. Now, around 10 a.m. of that day, Aaron's car's found abandoned. And unfortunately, even worse, in that afternoon, Aaron's body was recovered on East Antelope Road. He had been literally dumped over a dirt embankment. So his body had just been dumped and thrown away. When they find him, it's pretty evident, even though an autopsy hasn't occurred, that he suffered blunt force trauma. He's been bludgeoned to death. And because of the blood loss that occurred at the home, they could see that it was likely he was bludgeoned to death whilst he slept on the couch. Now, an autopsy that was carried out did later reveal that his cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head. So then it was obvious that he hadn't, of his own volition, ended up where his body was found. It was clear that he had been attacked horribly killed at that point and then transported to the location and at that point his body was discovered by the police. Now police immediately have three people in mind as the major suspects in relation to Aaron's murder. Ellie Fryer, Gavin McFarlane and Russell Jones. Russell Jones was a friend of Gavin's and the reason that they're hot-footed onto these individuals is that the three suspects were literally picked up by the police that day, they were all walking together along Barnet Road. So as far as the police are concerned, these three are the culpable party. All they need to do now is figure out who did what, where the responsibility lies, whether there was premeditation, and so on and so forth. They know that they've got the culprits. They just don't understand why the killing has taken place, and they need an explanation for that. So the young people are all brought in. For interrogations and Ellie's interview is conducted by Detective Stephanie Smith at the police station. I would say that the way you would describe Ellie in her interrogation is that she was highly uncooperative so she answered no to the question about who she was when she was asked are you Ellie? She said no. Hi. Hello. Are you Ellie? Yeah. No. What's your name? Instead, she claimed to be somebody that was called Rain. Uh, I at least need to know your name, though. Do you, you don't want to tell me your name? Rain. Rain. Also, she refused to give the names of Gavin and Russell, and she also informed the officer that she had the right to remain silent. She lied lots. In fact, she lied to things like questions about her graduation. She said that she graduated school that year even though she hadn't. When she was told that something had happened at her house, she feigned surprise. When she was told that there was a lot of blood and that her father was missing, Ellie basically said that's really disturbing to hear. So she's immediately painting a picture that she has no knowledge. She doesn't know what's gone on. In fact, at the point where she pretends to be somebody else, she isn't even acknowledging the relationship with her father per se because she is pretending that she is a different person. And when you think about 
what's going on in that scenario and what she's trying to achieve, it suggests, yes, an emotional immaturity because these are police officers, they're seasoned, they're going to be able to find out exactly who she is. But it's the willingness to try to distort reality that's quite shocking. She's 15. That's not something that we'd expect to see. I would say that Ellie almost comes across as an individual who is quite comfortable to be confrontational and is almost annoyed that she's been placed in a situation where she's being questioned. And that's, again, not something I'd expect to see for somebody who's 15 years of age. Now, Ellie also starts to open up about the relationship that she has with her father. And she actually says that the relationship was a little bit abusive and also prone to violent outbursts. She also tells the detective that a few weeks earlier he'd smashed her dog into a glass table, which would be an absolutely traumatic thing to see, and also a horrific act to carry out, if it were true. Also, she said that he called her names, he'd hit her on multiple occasions, and also that he had gone out of his way to shame her and ridicule her because she was a vegetarian. At the end of the day, that wouldn't be unusual in family relationships. Lots of people have got issues with vegans and vegetarians, believe me, I am one. And therefore, very often, I will have people suggesting that I should just enjoy a nice, big, juicy steak. And it's one of those things you just accept. You make life choices and people genuinely have a right to challenge you on those life choices. So even though she's bringing that in, that's not something that I think would give you license to have a deep resentment towards a particular individual in your life. Also, she says that yes, there's abuse, but it's just a little bit of abuse. And also she's talking about him ridiculing her for being a vegetarian on the same level. And you would imagine that that would be very minor compared to physical abuse. And I would say that when she gives this information over, she tends to provide it at points which aren't actually relevant at all to the questions that she's being asked. So it could be seen as a deflection. When she was questioned about the abuse, Ellie did say that he would masturbate next to her. And she actually did become extremely upset. She recounted a time where he had apparently ejaculated and got some of the sperm on her hand. She said that that made her feel very dirty. It made her feel ashamed. And she said that fathers aren't supposed to do that to their daughters. And of course, we cannot know whether she was abused in this way, but if any of those things had happened, that is horrific. And certainly feelings of shame and guilt and feeling dirty is something that young people and adult survivors talk about feeling when these kind of things happen. It's deeply confusing. It's harrowing to be a victim in these circumstances. And if that did happen to Ellie, that would be a truly tragic thing per se. But like I said, I can't say it happened. I can only say that she said it happened. I would also note that one of the things that's clear in the actual interrogations is that she speaks in a baby childlike voice. And I do wonder whether that's affected more than it would be in real life on a day to day level, because she's trying to come across as somebody who's innocent and somebody who is likely not capable of carrying out such a horrific crime against her own father. There are some odd things that she does during the interrogation, like she pretends to choke on water at one point. She also claims that she's been under the weather recently. And there is a point where the detective leaves her alone in the room with paper and some crayons and she actually doodles with them. So she carries on just kind of amusing herself. And it's a strange scenario to watch unfold. So for a period of time, she really isn't engaging with the reality of admitting that she has been involved in the murder of her father. It's all very deflection based and it's as if she feels if she can just keep going down that path for a period of time, she's going to get away with it. But then ultimately it starts to register because other people are talking about what's actually happened, that she's going to have to come clean to some degree. And she is somebody who is acutely comfortable with lying. They just trip off her tongue constantly without even a second's thought. Often what you'll see when people lie is there'll be a hesitation, there'll be a gap because it means that they can come up with something. They have to think about it first. It just trips off her tongue immediately, like she's been born to lie. And when 
they start to confront her with the fact that they know that she was involved with the murder of her father, the immediacy for her is to try to pin everything on Russell. So now she started to admit that yes, she has been to some degree around when her father's been brutalized and murdered, but now it's got absolutely nothing to do with Ellie, it's got nothing to do with Gavin, it's all to do with Russell. She says that it was all on him, he acted alone, and that she and Gavin had literally been oblivious to what was going on, despite the fact that she was there at the time of the murder. Also, just think about that for a minute. She's now suggesting that Russell, a guy who's not in a relationship with her, who hasn't had her father threaten him with a gun, who hasn't had her father potentially have him done for statutory rape, that Russell is going to be so angry or so moved by the situation between Ellie and Gavin that he's just gone ahead and murdered her father. And that somehow she's going to be able to concoct a story that will actually play out where he is found guilty of this heinous crime. So she said that basically, in her mind, all she'd wanted to do was run away, but that Russell suggested that they needed to take care of her dad. So obviously that is code for kill him. And she said that eventually she had agreed to that and had actually pressured Gavin into the situation. So now we have Gavin as this completely innocent party. He is a victim of circumstance. He's been coerced into this situation. He isn't the person responsible for the killing. He's just had to, as a passenger, go along with what's decided by both Ellie and Russell. But of course, when you're creating stories like that, you have to have it corroborated by the other individuals who were involved. And that just doesn't happen. So Gavin gets interviewed. And I would say that immediately he is more cooperative than Ellie police actually use a technique where they basically get Gavin to see that as far as they are concerned, he is the hero in this situation. So it's a technique where that's what you do. You basically make the person who is obviously the perpetrator feel like they were justified in their actions. So by painting Gavin as a hero or a protector, that's going to make him more likely to feel that firstly, the people who are investigating him don't think he's a terrible human being, but secondly, they give me enough rope to hang himself, essentially, because he's going to be like, yeah, I did have a reason to do this. And I'm not a terrible person because there's a morally justified explanation for my actions. So because of that technique, and it works very effectively with many people, it's likely that the suspect is going to be more forthcoming with the information. And Gavin, well, let's just say it worked. He was very forthcoming with the information. So when he's asked about Aaron's alleged abuse of his daughter, Gavin said that Ellie had actually told him that her dad would lay naked next to her in bed and would masturbate. He also claimed that Aaron was an alcoholic. So that also suggests that he felt that was an explanation for, let's say, volatile behaviour that Ellie suggested Aaron was capable of. But if you are Gavin and your young girlfriend is telling you that her father is physically masturbating in front of her whilst lying naked next to her, that is going to be rage provoking and it's going to be deeply disturbing because arguably that is highly inappropriate. It's obviously illegal. It would probably also further enrage him that you have Aaron who's using this moral policing by saying that he's going to have Gavin done for statutory rape if he is indeed actually sexually abusing his very own daughter. So for Gavin, that would likely be very much an incentive for being negative towards Ellie's dad, if what Ellie was saying was actually true. Now, recounting the events of the actual night and how things played out, Gavin said that he and Russell arrived at Aaron's home, at Ellie's father's home, about 2.30 a.m. He, at that point, climbed inside the window, so he got in the house through the window, and this is while Russell is waiting outside. At this point, Ellie passed some bags out the window, things like makeup, some clothes, and Gavin waits in the bedroom with Ellie, and they do that because they're waiting until Aaron's asleep. And then Ellie climbed out of the window and waited outside in the car with Russell. Gavin then said that when Aaron woke up, 
he ended up just acting on instinct and picked up the baseball bat and just repeatedly hit him with the baseball bat that obviously Aaron had bought to protect himself. He said that he continued to hit Aaron until he had gurgling sound. He said he genuinely in that moment didn't know what he was doing because he hadn't planned on killing him that way. The initial plan was to use chloroform on everyone in the house. That was including on Ellie's two younger sisters, but they were basically unable to purchase this. Now, that story in itself makes no sense whatsoever. They didn't need to wait until Aaron was asleep. It could have just been the next day when she was meant to leave for school that they could have all left at that point. There is no reason that they need to wait until he's gone to sleep to escape through a window. They're not prisoners. So that doesn't make sense full stop. You don't go to somebody's house to collect somebody to run away with them when there is a far easier solution just doing it in the daylight when you can go off and get some transport such as a coach to remove yourself from the area. Why do it in the dark of night? Why break into a home? It makes literally no sense. They had to be there because they wanted to do great harm to Aaron because they wouldn't be doing it in such a way and such a manner at such a time if it was just about leaving to get away from him. Now, Gavin said that he was really sorry. He said that he hadn't wanted to kill Aaron but he said that Ellie really did hate her parents and that she really wanted her father dead. She didn't want to ever see him again. And that she'd actually told Gavin that she really didn't want him around her sisters. And again, this is based in the premise that she is saying that he is abusing her as a father. Therefore, he is likely to abuse her sisters. So to protect them from that, she wants him dead. But that was extreme, without a shadow of a doubt. And also, we can only hear it from her perspective. However, it's also worth noting that in abuse cases, particularly sexual abuse cases, when a child is being sexually molested and there is a sibling around them, often they will see themselves as an individual who can protect the other child by allowing, and I don't mean allowing as in they want it, I mean as in allowing the abuse to happen to them instead of seeing their sibling harmed. So they sacrifice to some degree their own needs and their own sanctuary and safety to protect the people that they love. So with respect, that does fit in to what we see where abuse cycles take place. Often it's misguided because what we see with abusers is they'll often molest more than one person and because of the veil of silence and the secrecy that's involved in sexual abuse, very often siblings won't confide in one another because they're all thinking they're protecting the others and they all feel a deep level of shame about what's happening to them. So, like I said, this is what Ellie has said. I'm not saying it's true. I'm just bringing it in so that we have her perspective born into this particular story. Now, Gavin said that what he'd actually told Ellie was that he was going to kill her dad, but he didn't have the intention to. He was just going to get up and leave. But then Aaron had woken up as Gavin was trying to get out of the house. But turns out that's BS. He later confessed that when he actually attacked Aaron, he was asleep. That's literally why the couch was covered in blood because Aaron was laid down and then all of a sudden he was struck with the bat in his head and in his chest. Gavin believes that he hit him about six times and apparently after the second swing Aaron had said what the fuck, which he would because the impact would be monumental and then the second strike there would be that moment of what is happening and then of course after that you'd be rendered well unconscious or in fact dead. He also, when he was talking about this, reenacted the motion he used to hit Aaron with the bat. Now, after Gavin has killed Aaron, Ellie actually came into the house through the front door and she collected a dog who'd been on the couch. She also then took money out of her dad's wallet, about $40. At this point, Russell comes in and commented that the scene was really awful, said that this bloody scene was gross, in fact. And then he helped lift Aaron's body and he helped him actually carry him to the boot of the car, but not before he'd gone into the bathroom and been sick. So clearly, whatever Russell thought he was going to see, he was certainly not prepared for it. Because to have that kind of physical reaction, that demonstrates the absolute depravity of that scene. 
It also comes to light when the detectives are speaking to Gavin that Ellie had actually told Gavin and Russell that she was pregnant. Now, that's another lie. She didn't need to tell anybody that she was pregnant. She wasn't pregnant. But if you want to manipulate a situation to your advantage, make yourself seem vulnerable, Ellie's bright enough likely to know that Gavin is going to be more willing to harm her father if she suggests that she's having his baby. Because now he really is going to be the protector. He really is going to be the person who needs to be present with Ellie and father is getting in the way of that. Father can be a problem to that equation. So now he wants to do everything in his power so that they can be together as a unit, particularly if they're having a child. And Ellie must know that. And she's using that as more leverage to have her father killed. So that false information is very much about manipulation. And that speaks volumes about the character that Ellie is. They obviously have to interview Russell, the third party, and it's absolutely bizarre. I have no other word. I have no other word. Bizarre. It's one of the weirdest things. It was like looking into a scene from some kind of monologue from American Psycho. That kind of acting where a person genuinely is living in such a delusion that the act that they put on is like it's been scripted. It's absolutely random, very, very odd, and speaks to something deep-rooted and broken within Russell. So he willingly provides most of the information that the interrogators want completely unprompted. So let's just say it's like a tap that gets turned on and doesn't stop. He's the worst kind of person that you'd want to carry out a crime with, genuinely. If you ever think about picking a co-conspirator, he would not be the one. You want somebody who just remains stubborn. Be quiet, don't say anything. No comment, no comment. I'm going to get a lawyer. You don't want to rustle in this situation because you're like, Russell, can you? And then he just goes and goes and goes on and on and on and on. And he cannot shut up to the point that when the detectives have actually left the room, as we know, they often do because... It can cause quite a lot of stress and can be quite challenging for a person to be left by themselves. And these rooms are often quite uncomfortable. So you're provoking that level of need for that person to escape that situation, which is why they'll often talk. But when they're out of the room, Russell just starts to speak to the camera. So he's really, really owning that space. So he's repeatedly saying that he protected people. He's saying that he owned a protection business. At one point, whilst he's in the room by himself, he says it wasn't really self-defense so much as it was defending her. He also talked constantly about how the police have to understand how he knows exactly what's going on. He has this kind of strange confidence that doesn't seem really confident. It just seems like an absolute act, like he's not really aware of the seriousness of what's happened and where he is and that there's almost a enjoyment level to the character that he's taken on but it's covering the true person beneath it's almost like there's a disassociation from who he truly is and acting that way is a way of masking what's truly going on beneath the surface red means you can't hear me Green, you can. Gavin and Ellie are to be released to me because the assault her father did the morning of the incident, defending a female. Now, here's the thing. I know the cop's twisted little pathetic rule game. And actually... Sometimes I like to think that I invented the rule book. I'm not exactly bragging, but uh, I use reverse psychology. You want to play hardball? I played baseball when I was younger. Huh? I wouldn't go there. And I know everything that I'm saying is being recorded, and I'm doing it on purpose. I can easily turn the speaker off and rant, and then you guys will come in thinking I'm a loony because you don't hear me. 
Now, Russell, he said that Ellie had, very similarly to Gavin, told him that her father was a drunk. Also had told him about the incident where he'd masturbated next to her in bed. And he actually said that he told Ellie to just leave everything and get the hell out of there. So his advice was correct. That's exactly what should have happened. Ellie should have left. If it was so terrible, she should have confided in somebody or she should have just removed herself from that situation and gone with Gavin if that's what she'd chosen or wanted to do. The very reality is that that advice is appropriate advice. Get the hell out of there. And that's not enough for Ellie. She might have been advised to do that by Russell. But she wants more. She wants a level of vengeance that's unspeakable. Now, at one point during the time that he's alone in the interrogation room, Russell addresses the camera and says, you do know, I know you're listening to me. So listen here. Ellie Fryer is my client, my protectee. He also then goes on to demand that Ellie and Gavin are to be released to him. I mean, like I said, this is really bizarre. Literally, you know. Just release them to me. It's my job to protect them. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do you want us to go and get them now? Do you want to maybe have a McDonald's before you do that? I'd rather have a Burger King, but yeah, that'd be fine. You know, it just shows you that he isn't really in that space. It's not real for him. You do know I know you're listening, right? So listen here. Ellie? Fryer is my client, my protectee. I would like to see her asking, being polite. I know you're looking directly at me, aren't you? The information I gave is not worth six bucks. It's worth a lot uh, more. He also at one point says, don't make me release my bipolar. So, we can do this the nice way and we negotiate, or we can do it the hard way and I can release my bipolar. Which is again totally bizarre because you don't release your bipolar, you suffer from bipolar disorder, whether that's type 1 or type 2. It's not something that gets released like an alter ego we're not talking about Jekyll and Hyde. We're not talking about an individual who suddenly has a part of themselves that just takes over and does, I don't know, amazing things like the X-Men. But that's kind of the way he is suggesting it. It's almost like there is this, I am this powerful person that has this capability and capacity to protect people and I'm going to let this loose unless I get my way. And he does a lot of weird actions and he speaks like a cartoon supervillain at points and it's like he's seeming to be really intimidating to the camera. He also realises that he can turn the microphone on and off, essentially so that they can hear him or not hear him and he just gets completely fixated with that. It's that sense of, I've got the power now. But like I said, even though you can look in and say, well, this is somebody who is just overconfident, acting in a superior and arrogant way, it's not what I buy into when I look at it. I genuinely think that he's masking something that somewhere in his mind and psyche understands the gravity of the situation and it's too difficult to even consider or look at in the cold harsh reality where his actions are concerned. So he takes on this almost ridiculous alter ego that seems like they're totally in control but that's actually quite comedic to look at if you don't actually know what's gone on to lead him to be in that interrogation room. That delusion level, that heightened sense of self-importance, I think it's just shrouding and covering a deep insecurity and a deep inferiority. And from what I've garnered about this particular young man, it seems like he did have these ideas about morality and people who had known him said that often he had a very good heart, but he just didn't know how to use it in a way that was appropriate and that people could take advantage of that. Also, you can't help but think it's very strange that he's trying to bargain with the police after he's just told them everything that he knows. Like he's literally got no leverage left and yet he's saying that they have to release the other suspects to his care because he's this powerful protective person and yet he's confessed to what he's done. And that demonstrates, like I said, 
somebody who is either not able to compute the gravity of the circumstances he's involved with or is delusional within that space or is aware and is masking because it's too terrifying to acknowledge what he's truly done. Hey, maybe he does believe that they're all going to be released, but I'd be surprised if that were the case. Also, he gets on quite well with the officers because obviously he's very forthcoming and they treat you with respect in those circumstances. But then when the police are out of the room, he begins insulting the police officers to the camera. He says that he doesn't have a donut fetish because obviously there is that stereotype, isn't there? There is a stereotype. I do feel that I may have occasionally alluded to it myself that police officers, particularly American ones, have the old penchant for the Dunkin' Donuts. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Donuts are delicious. I'm just saying. Much to popular media, where whenever police officers seem to be having a natter, there seems to be a sugared, very nice fried donut in their hands with a coffee, that it just conjure those pictures up. But he's being derogatory about the fact that he hasn't got a donut fetish, but obviously the police have. Here's the thing. I'm not the one with the donut fetish. Give a cop a donut and he'll want a coffee to go with it. Give a mouse a cookie and he'll want a glass of milk. Give a moose a muffin and he'll want something else. But here's my favorite one. What is it when a cop car is towed by a tow truck? Pulled, pulled. <laughs> He also makes jokes about pigs. For those of you who might not be from the UK or America, particularly used as a derogatory word for the police is pig. So the pigs are coming, getting chased by the pigs, blah, blah, blah. So he's also been very derogatory in that level. And also he says, I don't care if you're a fed, I can still twist your little mind. Like I said, it's very much an act. It's quite uncomfortable to watch because when you're watching it, you just feel that there is something wrong with Russell. And realistically, he can't be of the soundest mind in those circumstances because his actions are 100% outlandish and bizarre. Now, when the investigators piece together what they think is true, because obviously they've got different accounts from the three suspects, the main belief is that Ellie had decided that she wants to run away with Gavin because she wants to be with him, but also, she wants to escape the alleged abuse of her father. And so to do that, they ask Russell to help them in their getaway. But he suggests that they should take it even further and that they should kill Aaron. And Ellie actually apparently liked the sound of that. Allegedly, Gavin wasn't actually convinced by that, but Ellie pressurized him. And along with Russell, they actually made these really detailed written notes about how they carry out the murder and how they would escape. It's absolutely bizarre how often this happens, isn't it? Like, surely anybody who's thinking about carrying out a killing, do they not get the memo that writing exactly what they're going to do, I don't know, has a strong potential to come back and bite them on the arse? But it seems to happen time and time and time again. Now, psychologically, I understand that we're dealing with younger people. Younger people sometimes have a bit of a penchant for the drama and don't necessarily write things that they are going to do. It can be that they're living in a state of fantasy. They enjoy the thrill and excitement. And let's say these three individuals together are fantasizing about possibilities as opposed to probabilities. That does happen. But they are going to take that and put it into action. And now essentially they have evidence that can be used against them in a court of law that connects them immediately with the killing and details exactly what they're going to do. Now one of the notes, which was written by Russell, being, take me out, Mr. Fryer, brackets, quietly. Another part of the plan was to take out my dad, quote, so they obviously originally planned to kill both Russell's father as well as Ellie's, but fortunately for Russell's father, that didn't happen. And I say fortunately, because we're talking about the fact that they did actually kill Ellie's father. So Russell's dad was certainly somebody who was seriously at risk. 
Gavin and Russell had initially planned to actually kill Aaron whilst Ellie was at a band competition on September the 30th. So that initial break-in that happened at Ellie's home, that was Gavin and Russell. And obviously they were giving her an alibi, clearly, because she would have been away at a band competition, which would have meant that the investigators weren't going to necessarily pin the crime on her or have her involvement within it. But when they actually got in there, they were spooked because Michelle was there. She was unexpectedly in the bedroom and they obviously wanted to harm Aaron. They didn't want to harm anybody else. Now, on the second attempt, Gavin snuck in through the window in the early hours of October the 2nd, waited till Aaron had fell asleep. Ellie had apparently given Gavin her dad's baseball bat to use as a weapon. But apparently when Gavin left the bedroom, he accidentally kicked over a rubbish bin in the dark. This woke Aaron up. And he actually shouted, who's there? At this point, Ellie said that it was her and she was going to the bathroom. And Aaron shouted, stop scaring me, because obviously he was spooked from what had happened in the break-in a couple of days earlier. It was obviously something that had even motivated him to have a weapon available to him. So he was on the edge nerve-wise. So they then wait till Aaron falls asleep again. This is when Gavin went downstairs and brutally beat him with the bat. This is when Russell comes in and immediately goes to the bathroom and is sick. He and Gavin then wrap Aaron in a blanket and a towel. They then move his body to the car. And because it was just such a brutal, bloody scene, there was blood everywhere. So they actually tried to use a towel for his head to soak up the blood. Also, Ellie actually did attempt to clean the blood up in the house. Now, before they exited, Ellie did actually go and say bye to her sisters, and she also told her sisters that she wouldn't be returning. The car that they left in, that was actually captured leaving the house on a neighbour's security camera at 5.50am. We get to the trial in October 2018, and Gavin goes ahead and pleads guilty to murder. He also pleads guilty to tampering with physical evidence and also aggravated burglary. You won't be surprised to know that he was sentenced to life in prison. He will be eligible for parole after 25 years. Doesn't mean he'll get it, but he'll be eligible for it then. Now, on January the 4th, 2019, Ellie did go ahead and plead guilty. She pled guilty for aggravated burglary and for conspiring to kill her dad. She was also given 25 years. Now, initially... That 25 years will begin being served at a juvenile correctional facility, but then she'll be transferred to an adult prison when she reaches 25 years of age. Ellie stood up in court and she read a statement in which she said, I'm not the same scared little girl I was over a year ago. I've seen all different kinds of people and now see humanity from a new compassionate perspective. Her attorney described Ellie as an extremely intelligent wonderful young woman who made a mistake quote which she can hopefully learn from just gonna throw it out there is it actually possible to minimize murder any more than that comment genuinely oh she just made a mistake she just made a mistake she just made a mistake what like leaving the oven on yeah like leaving the oven on when you're meant to be getting the food out and you burn it. It's just a, just a mistake. It's one of those things. Pretty sure she, she murdered her father. She had him brutalised by other people so that she could essentially, in her mind, escape him. Easy mistake to make. Easy mistake to make. Honestly, easy mistake. I'm pretty sure that she planned and premeditated the murder. There's actually written statements that doesn't suggest it's a mistake because it Mistakes usually something that happens by accident, whereas this seems pretty planned and premeditated. Premeditated mistake. A mistake. Just something that was planned and premeditated. She brutalised her father by using Gavin to beat him to death with the very thing he was using to protect himself. It's something that's very easy to do. It's just an easy mistake. It's just a mistake. I mean, it's not a mistake, is it? It's not a mistake, sorry. I do appreciate that people change. I do appreciate that young people in particular are not fully formed. We understand that the brain is developing all the way through to 25 years of age. I understand that 
young people make terrible decisions that happens but it's not a mistake and you don't get to say where murder is concerned you made a mistake which you can hopefully learn from ah oh, yeah hopefully hopefully even throwing the word hopefully doesn't give me hope just gonna say i mean surely it will mean that she learns or are you not convinced that she's even capable of that hopefully she's capable of it hopefully who knows she could make another mistake oh honestly these kind of things really upset me because let's just put it out there let's put it out there that ellie was in a nasty situation at home the idea that he her father's life was one that should come to an end in such a brutal way no matter what she was experiencing isn't true nobody should find themselves being battered to death with blunt force trauma at the hands of a young man who was having sex with the daughter of that particular person who was underage and who essentially themselves was criminally involved when it came down to the sexual relationship with Ellie. So the idea that somehow it was just a mistake and that she can just hopefully learn from it in the future, it just underplays the gravity of an individual whose life has been taken. Now, Russell's sentencing hearing, that gets delayed. And the reason for that is understandably, there was actually a question over his competence and whether he even had the capacity to decipher between right and wrong. However, as is the case most of the time, he was eventually determined fit to stand. And on August 11th, 2021, Russell entered a no contest plea to the charges of attempted robbery and conspiracy to commit murder. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison with two years of supervision once he is released. And arguably, some may say that it's not really fair that he got less time because to some degree, he was the one who was plotting and planning the idea of murdering Aaron with Ellie. Nonetheless, it could also be that he's quite a vulnerable individual, quite easy to manipulate, and somebody who wanted to be friends with those two individuals, Ellie and Gavin, at a detriment to his own well-being in the long term. I do genuinely feel that Ellie was highly manipulative around him, and I do think that he would be very, very easily led, ultimately, particularly if he believed that he was protecting Ellie because she was suffering abuse at the hands of her father. Now, on that point, it's very difficult to determine whether Ellie's claims about her father abusing her are true. And the reason that I'm saying that is because she is clearly a compulsive liar. I mean, bear in mind, she even lied to Gavin about being pregnant with his child. And therefore, she could very easily have been talking about the abuse to justify the murder, to justify her actions for wanting her father dead. Let's be honest, there are many people out there who endure the most horrific things at the hands of people who are men who care for them and love them, and they're desperate to escape. But... It could be that she was just making it up in that moment to make her seem less reprehensible. The fact that she pretended she was pregnant, or well, one could also say, suggests that maybe she was desperate. She just wanted this situation to end, so she lied to Gavin about the pregnancy, so that arguably he would act by removing her father from the picture, and she would deal with the consequences afterwards because she was just desperate to escape. So again, that's another possibility. But I will note that according to other people and lots of other accounts, Aaron was actually a good father. But equally, those reports will obviously be from people who knew him and liked him. It doesn't totally eliminate the possibility that he could secretly have been abusing Ellie. That happens all the time. One of the things that was claimed was that Ellie was caught having sex on a school bus when she was only 13 years of age. And that's very young to be having sex and also to be having sex on a school bus, well, that's deeply problematic because your peers are gonna be able to see that happening. That's gonna to lead to you probably encountering problems at school itself. And also it shows that sexual behavior and the boundaries expected within it are not things that you align yourself with. And if you're being abused, often your sexual behavior will be different to that of your peers because as I've said, your body is being abused by somebody who's meant to protect you or meant to care for you 
And therefore, when others use your body in a sexual way, you're more willing to have that happen because you've got this lack of worthiness around your own self-esteem. You've got a lack of worthiness around your own body. You get used more easily because the very people who are meant to protect you fail to protect you and you're a victim. So even though you're the person having sex at 13 years of age on a bus, it's not because you want sex at all. It's because your behavior has been dramatically changed by the abuse that you're suffering. And you put yourselves in risky situations because your protective mechanisms that should be around you and should have looked after you have failed you. And what's really upsetting about situations and circumstances like that is that ultimately the child will find themselves being bullied or being given particular slurs by other peers because their behavior seems so outlandish compared to their own when really they're just a victim who's suffering. So that kind of behavior, the risky impulsive behavior could be a sign that she was abused. And when police actually spoke to Ellie's friends, they did actually confirm that Ellie had indeed been telling them that her father was emotionally and physically abusive. So she told her friends that he was mistreating her and her sisters. They didn't know because obviously they're the young people whether it was actually true, but it was certainly something that she talked about. They hadn't seen evidence of the abuse but she was informing them that it was happening. So that means that the claims of abuse, they weren't just invented at the time of the interrogation. It wasn't simply an attempt to get herself out of trouble. And even though she introduced it in a way that didn't necessarily talk about the severity of it that eventually comes out when she's talking about her reasoning for being motivated to kill him, it was there, it was present. She was kind of talking about it early on on a more minimal level and that gets expanded as the case goes forward but her friends within school and Gavin and Russell had all been informed by Ellie that she was suffering abuse at the hands of her father but she could just be a absolute manipulator and a huge pathological liar and actually her friends did say that one of the things about Ellie was that she was a liar they couldn't often tell whether she was telling the truth because she was one of those people that would spin a yarn, so to speak. Now, many people, especially who knew Aaron, they actually believed that the murder was the fact that Aaron was unhappy with his daughter dating Gavin. And there's a really unusual moment when she is talking to the detectives who are obviously trying to find out information about what's played out in the crime. And Ellie says that the Romeo and Juliet defence could be used. Now, it doesn't exist, by the way. There isn't a Romeo and Juliet defence. Like, number one, just going to throw it out there, it doesn't end well. It doesn't end well for Romeo and Juliet. So it's not a defence. What defence? The defence where both the young people die after some kind of horrible scenario unfolding with the families and then getting it wrong at the very moment where, in truth, things could have worked out if they hadn't gone ahead and died in such a horrible way because accidentally one thought the other was dead and then the other decided that they would end their own life. It's not a defence. There's never been a defence in court like that. But I think what she was trying to say in her interview was that basically there was a defence where two people are star-crossed lovers and they're being denied access to one another and it provokes a rageful reaction. Like I said, doesn't exist, but certainly suggests that that's where Ellie's mindset was. That she was being denied the opportunity to be with the man that she believed that she loved and therefore the consequences with her father were born out of the frustration that she felt about that, that she had this deep resentment towards her father with surrounding this, and she wanted it over. Now, if Gavin, at the time of killing Ellie's father, actually felt that he had some kind of justification because of the abuse that she was allegedly suffering, there's a massive irony there, isn't there? Because that would have him seeing himself as Ellie's protector when technically he's actually in an illegal sexual relationship with her himself. So a very twisted web when it comes down to the actual logic behind that mindset. Now in this case, it can definitely be argued that one of the things that occurred is that Ellie manipulated Russell and Gavin. She made them feel that killing her father was actually justified because she needed protection. And also I would say that she was definitely the brightest of the three of them. She was actually, in spite of what I've just said, still a minor. The other two were adults. So the two men were 
grown-ups as far as the law is concerned. It's also worth noting that, like I said, I do think that she was deeply manipulative, but she was still a child. These guys did have checkered pasts. So they weren't naive boys. They weren't simply led astray. So Russell had previously been charged with third-degree sexual assault and also third-degree sodomy. And Gavin, well, with respect, he was said to be quite a violent individual. He'd broken someone's nose before. He would fight people, even if there wasn't actually a good reason to fight the person. He'd even threatened somebody at school by sending them a photo of a gun. And one of Gavin's friends, a guy called Austin, he said that one of the last times that he'd seen Gavin before the murder, Gavin had wanted to wrestle him. So quite an unusual physical person. And then when he was attending high school, what the other students thought about him, and I've got to say, when I watched him in an interview with the police, I actually said to my partner, my husband, this guy looks like a potential school shooter, genuinely. And actually, in the high school, others felt like he was a potential threat. And the school was that concerned that they conducted an actual threat assessment on him and also a threat to self-assessment. So basically, they were worried that he could be a risk to others and a risk to himself. And like I said, an acquaintance said that people used to joke that if there was going to be a school shooter, it would probably be Gavin. I totally connect with that. I'm sure you will do too. Also, it turns out that he used to talk to his friends about the fact that he'd be able to get away with killing someone. Apparently, he'd watched a lot of documentaries. I mean, that's how it works. I mean, if you're going to kill somebody, just do the ABC of watching the documentaries. You'll just have to watch a Netflix three-parter and you'll be able to get away with murder. Even though all of the documentaries clearly evidence that it's actually near impossible to get away with murder. But hey, Gavin didn't get the memo on that one. The fact that the documentaries were being made because the people had got caught. Honestly, logic out of the window. Where's logic, Gavin? I don't know. I'm watching a three-parter on a guy who got caught thinking he got away with the perfect murder so that I can plan the perfect murder. Honestly, I know that loads of you are sat at home right now going, yeah, whatever, Emma, I could totally get away with the perfect murder. I know, I'm just saying, Gavin isn't the kind of person who would be able to do that, as is clearly demonstrated in what I've talked about so far today. But apparently, even though he would say these things, no one actually ever took him seriously. People don't. You don't take it seriously when somebody is talking about the fact that they could get away with the perfect murder. Because no one wants to think that they're hanging out with a potential killer. Also, after the murder, it came to light that he'd been living with two separate roommates, but neither of the roommates knew about the existence of the other. Very odd. So basically, lived in two separate places with two different people, but didn't actually acknowledge that that was a reality or talk about the existence of the other. Very, very bizarre. Now, despite the fact that Gavin was clearly violent, I would still say that Ellie was very good at manipulating him and that she, in my opinion, was the orchestra of her father's murder. You can tell just by the confidence that she has and the willingness to lie in the police interrogation videos that she is highly manipulative. To be so young and yet so capable of playing a game of cat and mouse with the detectives after having killed your own father is very, very unusual. And I know that it is a very challenging situation when we're talking about an individual who has told the authorities that they have been sexually abused to say that they are a liar. We can't do that. I don't know whether Ellie was sexually abused, but what I can say is she lies consistently and easily, and she is a high-level manipulator. So whatever has happened to her in her past, that doesn't mean that she would be the person that she is acting like because of that abuse in the interrogations. It doesn't mean that she would be somebody because of that abuse that would feel comfortable having her father murdered. They are not in line with one another. People who are sexually molested often don't feel entitled to even be treated kindly by other human beings because their self-esteem and self-worth has been so broken down 
so harmed by the horror that they've had to deal with, they're not puppet masters very often. They're individuals instead who often have their strings pulled by others. And that's one of the problems when you've been a victim. Becoming a survivor takes time because you've been controlled and you've been beaten down by the horrible things that happen to you. That's not what Ellie comes across like. Ellie comes across as a very adept liar. And even if she did suffer the abuse that she's talked about, we have to separate that from who she is and the actions that she carried out. And like I said, I can't state whether she was abused, whilst a lot of people around her said it simply wasn't true. People who knew her father said it wasn't real. At the same time, we do appreciate that for the most part, you don't know about people being abused. And you can have neighbors and friends who've been through the most torturous situations and they never even talk about what occurred because they're so deeply affected and so deeply ashamed of what actually happened to them. So secrecy is an element of abuse. But like I said, what's hard with Ellie is because she lies so easily about so many things, it's hard to see what she says about the abuse as being entirely truthful as well, which is a shame because if she was sexually molested by her father and she did endure those things, then she must have had a truly horrific childhood and she must have felt abandoned and not protected and she would understandably have horrible wounds around that. But one of the things about her as well is it does seem like she likes to invent lies to evoke sympathy, like the fake pregnancy. And even though she may have wanted to protect her sisters, which is one of the arguments, leaving her sisters after killing her father is not necessarily the most protective mechanism. Again, it doesn't go hand in hand with actual logic. And let's put it into the position where her father needed to be murdered to protect her sisters. Well, once it was done, why did she need to leave? So again, it doesn't really make sense. Now, I don't think that just because she's manipulative that Gavin and Russell are any less guilty. They aren't, they are absolutely as guilty as she is. Michelle, who is Aaron's girlfriend, she said that his heart must be broken because he loved his girls above anything. So from her point of view, she genuinely believes that Aaron wouldn't be able to believe it because he adored his children. That was her perspective. Aaron's sister Maria, she said that he had been a wonderful little brother, saying that he always, always was good to me. And it was also a really good father. Aaron's friends also spoke about what a generous character he was. One of his friends, somebody called Utana, said that he was the type of guy that would do anything for you. If you needed something fixed around your house or your lawn mowed or help you moving, you could rely on Aaron. She said he would share whatever he had and that he was always somebody you wanted to know. She also commented that Aaron had nothing but love for his daughters. It's also notable that when it came down to Ellie actually being sentenced, the courtroom was very much divided. So you had her mother's side very much with Ellie and you had a father's side very much against Ellie. So the mother and the grandmother, they felt the sentence was too harsh. They felt that it was something that was unfortunate, but that she was going to spend a lot of her life right up until when she's 40 years of age, essentially locked up. And they felt that that was too much of a punishment. But we're talking about the brutal beating, murder, and dumping of a body of her father. It doesn't get more harrowing than that. That is the highest level, crime-wise. So the idea that 25 years is too long, when we're talking about a human life being snuffed out, I think that that's pretty delusional with respect. I understand that they love her and care for her, and I understand that they would have good intentions about those mindsets and beliefs, but she killed her father. She may not have been the person who held the bat, but she was the person who may as well have been orchestrating that occurring. And she has to face a very strong consequence. Yes, she was a young person, she was 15, but nonetheless, at 15, you know right from wrong, she was a very bright young person. And even if she had suffered, as she suggested that she suffered at the hands of her father, the brutality that was shown to him is not consistent with her experience. With respect, there were other options available to her. She could have told the adults in her life that would have been protective around this. 
She could have spoken to the authorities. She could have done so many other things. And I suppose that some people will come in and say, well, with respect, when you think about battered wife syndrome, where an individual ultimately is psychologically in such a torturous prison that they cannot think about escaping any other way than killing the perpetrator. And we see that play out. It's rare that that defense is actually used successfully, but it has happened. And rightfully so, because when you are completely trapped in a mindset where you think you'll never be able to escape because the person will always find you and chase you and harm you, ultimately you make that decision and you kill them. But that's not what we're seeing where Ellie is concerned. She was free to come and go. Even when her father was saying no to her relationship with Gavin, she carried on. So we're not seeing an individual so controlled, so fearful for their own life that ultimately the only way forward was to murder her father. She knew what she wanted and she achieved what she wanted. And that was for her father to no longer have the control over her or Gavin's relationship, which is a ridiculous overreach and ultimately meant that her and Gavin have no future together. Yes, she was 15. Yes, 15-year-olds definitely have the capacity to change. Yes, 15-year-olds are not the same person as they will be at 25. Is it likely that when she is 40 that she'll be a threat to society? Probably not. Does she deserve a long time frame in prison for what she did to Aaron Fryer? 100%. 100%. I hope that she takes those years and uses them well and eventually comes out and lives the rest of her freedom as a pro-social human being with meaning to this world. I hope she figures out the level of remorse that is required when you've taken a human life. And I hope that if she has her struggles, those struggles are met with support while she is incarcerated. And at the end of the day, she will get to live almost a full life outside when she's freed. She will likely marry even though she will be older, ultimately she may still be able to have children and she will have a rhythm of life that will continue for many years. So she has far more than she afforded her father. Let me know your thoughts on this. Like I said, such a strange one when it comes down to the interviews and interrogations and just that stark reminder that sometimes the people that we need to be most afraid of other people who are meant to love us more than anything else in the world. Take care. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. I'll see you again Wednesdays and Sundays. As ever, crime and consistency is my catchphrase. Take care, guys. Be safe.